the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have found it. Fun Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, Charlie says screenwriter Guinevere Turner, an extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile screenwriter, Michael Werwe. When I'm in a writing phase, my, my sole concern is telling a compelling dramatic story. And I don't want to do anything that's so glaringly wrong that it defies reality. Um, but it is, it is a narrative film, and so I always prioritize emotional truth over the factual truth. In this episode, extremely wicked, shockingly evil and vile screenwriter Michael Werwe and Charlie Says screenwriter Guinevere Turner discuss the challenges of crafting compelling entertainment while respecting the human stories at the heart of the crime. Clearly, there's a huge interest in this. And, and I don't know whether it's, you know, podcast, the growth of podcasts again, the sort of coming back, certainly seems to have fueled a lot of it. Why, were the, why was Netflix so interested in creating two Ted Bundy projects at the same time? People are just fascinated by kind of the strange and the taboo and the things that are shameful to talk about in public. You know, I think when, this, when my script went around in, in, in 2012, um, I was taking a million general meetings and people were almost like confessing in secret their secret fascination in serial killers and true crime. You know, that was before serial and before the jinx and before it was like a, a cool thing again. And I, I think there's always been an appetite for it. It's just nobody's felt comfortable talking about it. But now I think podcasts are, are really um, deserve a lot of the credit because there are so many that examine these stranger than fiction events. And there's just something, I don't know, there's something dramatically enticing about that. I've been thinking a lot about why why people love true crime and why people love, love serial killer stories and cult leaders. And it's it's this, to be honest, it's this us and them kind of mentality. Like, my life is fine because I'm not like those people or I would never get sucked into that. So let's start talking about um, your two main characters and, and what was the attraction and how you, the attraction to telling a story about them and how you got started. I actually had never intended to write a movie about Ted Bundy. I was trying to... I was a bartender at the time, and I was writing um, spec after spec, trying to game the system of like big action thriller commercial material, and I just hit a block. I didn't care about what I was writing about. So uh, I picked up a book about Ted Bundy. I always loved uh, true crime, but I didn't really know anything about him. And I thought I was, I was just reading it to procrastinate, and I saw a story that was just too good to, to pass up. And I know it had been done and told before, but never from a perspective of the people who knew him. And to me, I saw, I saw that as an interesting way into an otherwise familiar story, to tell a, a serial killer story with no serial killing in it. Um, in kind of the same way that Reservoir Dogs is a heist movie with no heist in it. I, I just liked an, a unique perspective into this story. And um, as for Ted Bundy himself, like I just, I think aberrant behavior is, is interesting. And I, th I thought it was even more interesting to tell this story in a way where you don't see that behavior and you kind of get seduced by the, by the the man, and it becomes, um, it's a con man story, really. It's a catch me if you can for adults. And going over your years is actually kind of a sideways way in to Charlie Manson, um, right? It's from the perspective of the women who were with him. Yeah, it focuses on the, the prison time of the women who killed for Charles Manson. So it's a very different perspective on that story that, to be honest, when the producers came to me, and said, we want to make a film about the Manson girls, it was a big, fat eye roll. I was like, really, why? My first film was a romantic comedy. i just like to point out, somehow I found myself here. Uh, but so I started doing research, as you do, and trying to find something new to say 
about these this whole story. And eventually I found what a book that is the basis for a lot of the movie, which is a book that was written by a grad student that is on a Canadian academic press that is about a, a, the woman who spent five years teaching them when they were on death row. And then suddenly we had a story. Something for you to take a look at for next week. The Bible is the only book Charlie let us have around. Charlie says that authors are evil, trying to play mind tricks on the reader. So do you feel like you'd be doing something bad by studying with me? Because if you are going to do these classes with me, you're going to have to read books. It took them seven years to stop starting every sentence with Charlie Says, which is what the movie, why the movie's called that. I was interested not in ooh, like they're crazy and he's crazy and everyone's crazy and there's, you know, all these things I was interested in. The question we all have when you, we think about people in cults and the extremes that they go to is how did he get them there? And so I really wanted to see if I could dig into that. How did he get them there? That he knew them for less than a year when they were killing strangers for him. Yours was also sort of based on, um, even though it was a spec script, You it was that the woman had written a book about being with Ted Bundy. It was told through the perspective of his of his longtime girlfriend who had written a book in the 80s about the, the long, slow process of learning these horrific things about the person he, she, loved, she loved. I just finished watching um, Michael's movie this morning because I actually really don't like scary movies. <laughs> and I was so, I started watching them, and then I'm like, I can't, I don't want the murder part, I don't want to see the murder part, but then I realized I kind of professional respect had to see the movie, and I was like, oh, he's doing a really interesting thing. We're not, not showing the murder, mm -hmm. but unlike my movie, which is unapologetically sympathetic to murderers, um, <laughs> <laughs> Yours is uh, is not. It's it really feels like it's as I now realize it's the, it, that woman who almost married him. It's her story. So I'm just interested in that as well. Just sort of what how you felt you were skirting the line between showing this man was charming and he genuinely loved her, but can you genuinely love someone when you have like just killed woman number forty three in some brutal way? Well, that is kind of the central emotional question of the movie, you know, and, and hopefully that's what's debatable when you come out of it. And there's no right answer and nobody can ever fully know. But the intention of writing it that way was to put the audience in the same perspective as his girlfriend was, as the public was the entire time in that era. I mean, we obviously go into the movie with the baggage of knowing that he did it. Um, but if, if we're successful, the chemistry between Zac Efron and Lily Collins, the love story is what you buy into. And if we get seduced into that dynamic, the relationship of the characters, then the big twist of the movie is not did he do it or did he not do it, but is he going to be honest with this woman for the very first time in his life? She was deposited in the woods. Then animals could have conceivably done something like animals that. Animals don't do that. I'm not a bad guy. You need to release me, Ted. So it's kind of a deceptive twist. When the spec script went around, it wasn't known as the Ted Bundy movie. Nobody knew what it was. Um, nobody knew who that Ted was Ted Bundy until deep into the script. And so the, there was kind of a big Kaiser Soze moment in the spec stage of it all. What happened to her head? The drama was never constructed to be dependent upon Kaiser Soze. It's, oh my God, he just said this to the one person he, he has to sever all ties with at this point. And, and so that was the goal. And, um, and we wanted to approach it that way because it at least gave more integrity to uh, a story that caused so much suffering and still so with victims' families and people that are still around who remember the aftermath of it. That moment when he writes the word on the window, is that that's from her book? 
That is not. So I, it was not an adaptation of her book. I, I read eight books by all by primary sources. Hers was one of it, one of those books. But she obviously was not um, part of so many things when he was in jail and on trial. Um, but it is it is a narrative film, and so I always prioritize emotional truth over the factual truth. I try to stick to the facts as much as I can, but if it doesn't change history and it doesn't change the end result of what you're saying in the bigger picture, that to me is all I care about when I'm crafting a story. moment in particular is kind of a fusion of, he did confess to her, he did it over the phone, um, and he did write Hacksaw to explain one of his crimes to a detective who was getting a confession. And so that was, I felt like, preserving the emotional truth of um, him still admitting to her how the way he did it and doing it in a way that, I remember when I first read that Hacksaw detail in this obscure book, I got chills when I read it and I always remembered this moment and I knew that was my ending from even before starting the script, so I kind of worked backwards from that. How do you pare it down to what's an audience going to be entranced by? Where are we going to, what story are we going to be interested in following to what angle are you going to want to tell? And you each clearly had one. So can you talk about how you went through that process of all that material and then narrowed it down? You know, when, I, when I research, I just inundate myself with as much as I can. I read, watch, and listen to everything I can find. Um, and I prefer primary sources if possible, and there was a lot with, with Ted. Um, and what became interesting to me and the kind of the common thread of all of these books was just this kind of magnetism that he had um, or, or some odd attraction that they had despite some of them knowing about the crimes. You know, others didn't know it until much later. And to me, that was interesting to tell a story where it was really kind of a seduction. It was a con man story of sorts. In order to get that betrayal, I knew that we had to kind of pound the other side um, and buy into the, the relational dynamic. So I wanted to start it after all the crimes had happened. So I didn't have to worry about that. It was just all the denials of it. And how about you? You, you did show some of that. Well, I had written the script with the crimes being really just flashes of images because I thought to myself, and, you know, I don't want to be exploitive. I don't want to show this stuff one more time. I, that's not the point of this movie. The point of this movie is understanding these women and how they got to where they are. And so in my script, they were very like impressionistic almost. And then when Mary Heron, uh, this is our third film together, she came on as a director, and we had this long, really interesting conversation about do you look like you're too forgiving if you don't face it head on and what's what's exploitive and what's just saying let us not forget this is the horror of what happened um and so she really talked to me into the fact that we needed to have at least one scene and these crimes were particularly messy and you know these were not professional criminals they'd never killed anyone before so just sort of living with that that was important and and I think she was very right and I'm glad I did that because I realized it would have looked like I was just too much of a chicken to make scary scenes which let's face it I am <laughs> well one of the challenges I found was excising the right material that didn't serve the story I mean I came across so much fascinating research that was just too good to not put in the script and for a long time these things were in there because they were just they're stranger than fiction, but um, but they didn't ultimately serve the story. They're kind of muddying the waters and, and got us off track. So, you know, it was painful at the time to lose certain things in the, in the writing phase, but that that was required in order for like the more for the less sensational things to still play. Um, because even though something actually happens in real life, doesn't mean it's going to sell dramatically. And uh, those are hard choices to make. Well, you had some funny, really funny moments in your script. When he jumps out that window, that was an out loud laugh. Ticket for an aeroplane Ain't got time to take a fast train Lonely days are gone I'm a going home My baby just wrote me a letter I don't care how much money I gotta spend Got to get back to my baby Lonely days are gone I'm a going home My baby for the longest time, I opened the script with jumping out the window because I thought that was the tone that you could look at it and that he presented it to you if you knew him in that moment. 
And so to me, that felt true. I could, I could justify an absurdist tone because that's how it would have been. Um, now, if, if it wasn't like that in the moment, it would have been disrespectful to so, on so many levels. You have to put yourself kind of in, that, in, the, time, in the time space and the headspace of, of those people. Yeah. Well, and I mean, to that point, you really did that. I mean, those scenes where they're in the prison are very powerful moments because they it feels like exactly what you're talking about. What the hell do you think about in here? I have to reflect at this point on what, where, how I got here, what happened. And yet it took them a long time to reach that point. To- because they were sentenced to death and then the death penalty was lifted, they were not allowed to enter. They were stuck in, on death row and not allowed into general population, which is the worst thing you can do to someone who's been in a cult is leave them with each other. Like the black man's work. Blackie's been waiting for this. Blackie's ready. And then the picket cops will come down on Blackie when they find the rich dead piggies and the revolution will begin. You understand me? Helter Skelter is upon us. <laughs> Lulu, what's wrong? Do you ever start to think that maybe Helter Skelter isn't coming down at all? That Charlie was wrong? No. No. Don't let this place get to you. It would be happening right now if we weren't in here. Please don't give up now. Okay. And so that was also part of the point of my movie is is also just being sympathetic to people who've been in cults so that nobody understood the psychology of what they need. Uh-huh. It was like other people who don't who are like, what the f- are you talking about? Is one one place to start. <laughs> How do you, again, how do you embody that um, character? Because you had to, it wasn't just them in your film. You you have a lot of Charlie. You mean, you have him yeah. being... Yeah, I really didn't want it to be Charlie's movie, but obviously in order to tell the story, you have to see what the, the part where he was charming and charismatic and then just watch it turn. Mm-hmm. What I really want people to feel is, wow, if I was 19 and it was 1968 and I met this guy and all these people and... Would I? And then that's, that's to me, the, always the, the implicating, you know, in the same way that you were saying that you thought, mm, you know, would I have, you know, helped, um, you know, would I have chatted up um, Ted Bundy in a bar? Maybe. What do we have here? Gypsy. Said Leslie would be happier with you. Gypsy, 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 my baby gypsy. You brought someone just like I asked. Now it's a good soldier. <laughs> 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 Be my mirror. <laughs> my name's Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I just started thinking about it uh, in the way that people talk about uh, uh, abusive relationships, Mm -hmm. how people get in them and how people get stuck in them, which is to say, tell you that you're beautiful in a way that no one else has told you. Then, Then morph that into tell you that no one else sees how beautiful you are, isolate you from the people who love you, and then just when you're feeling safe, take that love away make you dependent on it and then give it back. And that's just, then as I just described, you know, just a two person abusive relationship. I took much the same approach. I thought about it like an abusive relationship. I, I, I thought, you know, can we, can we gaslight the audience who knows they're being gaslit and still be successful in the end? Um, and that was always very fascinating to me. And I, and I keep going back to the fact that I always think of it as a love story. And it, it's basically Romeo and Juliet with a court case in between the two of them. Um, it's a romantic tragedy is really what it is. And um, they have to come to the first moment of truth in the end. And, and when, I, when I reduce it to that, to the archetypal love story of it all, I'm not in a dark headspace every day when I'm reading. If we were in a relationship with somebody like that, that would be the point of view we would have and only that. Nobody ever sees a serial killer in action. You know, a movie can see that because you choose the perspective. But in real life, you see who's with you in the kitchen making eggs and you see, um, you know, the guy on the TV screen running the trial like a charade. You know, he really was the first reality TV star. It was the first time there was cameras in the courtrooms, and he understood the power of that before anybody else. He was able to make an impression 
through his looks, through his, uh, he was articulate, he was a law student, you know, he was, he was able to really exploit that. I have to question the competency of this expert witness. Your Honor, I question the competency of this entire trial. This is a farce. Oh. Dr. Suverin, on that, we could not agree more. <laughs> I feel duty-bound to remind you in the gallery that you were not on spring break. You are not waiting for the Flipper and Friends show at SeaWorld. It is a capital murder case. The court has already ruled on this witness's expertise, Counselor. And you are skating on thin ice, and ice does not last long in Florida. Yes, Your Honor. The hope is that that's where the movie turns and you're no longer being seduced by him, but you're watching this slow motion train crash. And so that's, there's a feeling of dread and disgust that starts to build at that point. And you know, if you watch it a second time, I mean, I think it feels like a horror movie. It's just very dark because you know these awful, awful things. And I look at it as a movie of like purging trauma almost. You, know, you, you have to confront this and acknowledge it. And sometimes that takes 10 years in her case. And you only get rid of something like that when you confront it. Well, in your case, though, your, your film went the opposite way. You're actually going through all this to help us see these women in a completely different light, you know, not as horrific as they have been made out to be. I'm trying to, to paint a portrait that's just complex. Uh -huh. I'm not forgiving them. I'm not, I'm, I'm just trying to say this could be you. A lot of the stuff about the women that I wrote about uh, talks about, you know, one of them was a exotic dancer and like one of them you know her parents got divorced when she was a teenager like you know people trying to put this sort of things that happened to them or experiences they had in their childhood made them cold-blooded murderers i loathe this idea that the a to b to c of um just trauma and experiences we have is going to make us this thing because i'm sure many people must have had traumatic experiences and are not serial killers so i was really i when it, when the mom shows up in your movie i was like oh god Please don't ruin your movie by having it be like, the mom was X, Y, or Z, and you didn't. But it did make me want to Google what the mom was. But uh, so yeah, I Googled it too. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, where was she? And they had such a weird dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was glad you didn't go down that path. So that was a really important thing for me too, is to say anyone could be here, and it's not about your difficult childhood. I think you should leave here. I came to help you do that. It looks like you're being made to stay here against your will. I can take you right now. You can drop that broom, get on my bike, and we'll be gone. Nobody will stop us. No. I found myself thinking, what do you do when you are just in a cell and you're thinking over and over and over about how you got there and you, I'm sure you just get down to that choice that you made. Mm -hmm. The way the actress Hannah Murray plays it, I think also is like, she almost wants, she considers it. And that would have been the best decision she could ever have made. In in your film, one of the those moments that I found like really impactful as well with a, a decision about where is this, since it was from her position, from Liz's position, right, is that she's thinking she calls to the police. I'm the one who gave his name to the police. He was described as 5'7 to 5'8, neck length hair, brown to light brown, dark Tan, 160 pounds, cast on the left arm. King County Sheriff's Department. Back when those girls disappeared from Lake Sammamish, I saw a sketch. It's a minor resemblance, but it's, it's very, very minor. And what I, kind of car did he drive? It's a 1968 Volkswagen Bug, but it's kind of a light beige. Let me stop you right there. It's the right car, but it's the wrong color. He's not the guy. I can put his name down if it'll help you sleep at night. What is his name? Uh, Ted. Ted Bundy. 
Can you talk about your reasoning for that and where you were trying to lead us? It was kind of a, you know, doing a parallel track of both of our main characters. The way that Ted Bundy had the, these awful secrets, she also had an awful secret. It, it, this whole, the whole time she's blaming herself, believing that she put him in this mess. And this is, this is, this is based on a series of multiple phone calls she actually made. Um, and then for years and years and years thought that she was the reason why all of these things were happening to him. And it was a very slow process of acceptance, but we wanted that to be a big struggle for her emotionally. She became a very unreliable narrator at a certain point too. And, um, and I thought that was interesting just from a, a story craft point of view, if you had two characters that are very similar, but you don't really know that in the middle of the story. You've been watching Telling True Crime Stories on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story Project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. See On Story Live? Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.